when horror movie characters visit a cabin in the woods, we, the audience, know their fate is sealed. Isn't that right? Still, most of us don't really believe that a trip to a vacation cabin would ever truly result in tragedy. This is the story of the Bowles family. On a swelteringly hot summer night, this family was brutally murdered in their new mountain cabin, leaving a community in shock and a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Join me for a ride through Strange and Mysterious here at Odd Mysteries Stories. On a Friday the 13th in August of 1965, yep, you heard that right, Friday the 13th. I didn't make that up. It's actually a fact of this story. The Bowles family left their primary residence in Orange County, California, to take their first weekend trip to their vacation cabin in Crestline, California. It was a wooded mountain getaway on Jungfrau Road, sitting on a steep hillside in the Club San Moritz area of San Bernardino County. The family purchased the land in 1955 and took a decade to build their little slice of paradise. They would never return home. A cold-blooded killer would enter the cabin between 8 p.m. and 9 p.m. on Saturday, August 14th, and would ultimately shoot James Bowles, Darlene Bowles, and their two young sons 42 times before speeding away in the bright red Bowles family car. Police interviewed thousands of witnesses and pursued hundreds of leads but they came up empty. Two arrests were made, but the suspects couldn't be definitively linked to the case. And the oddities don't end there. You might feel a few chills running up and down your spine when you discover how strange this case really is. James Bowles, aged 41, was an engineer at Hughes Aircraft Company in El Segundo. His wife, Darlene, aged 37, was an electronics assembler at Hughes Aircraft in Fullerton. Hughes Aircraft officials considered them a company family. Both James and Darlene were known to be good, reliable employees. They had two sons, Bob Bowles, aged 13, and Tom Bowles, aged 12. They shared their Fountain Valley home in Orange County with their flop-eared Doc Shun, Barbara. While the thought of being able to afford both a home and a vacation home would signal wealth to us today, by 1965 standards, they were not considered particularly wealthy. They were seen as solidly middle class. Captain Charles Callahan of the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office later described them as, quote, not rich, not poor. Just a normal, happy family on a weekend outing in their new mountain cabin. A pretty picture, but was it an accurate one? By the time you hear the entire story, you may have cause to believe that this normal happy family had some secrets. Crestline was an extremely popular vacation town located between the Angeles National Forest and the San Bernardino National Forest. Most of the homes in the area were vacation homes, like the Bulls. Only a few thousand people lived there full time. On this particular weekend in August, however, some 120,000 Californians took to the road to visit those vacation cabins. Southern California temperatures had risen, and the mountains were nice and cool. Police would later interview nearly every vacationer they could track down. These cabins were not isolated. The nearest cabin to the Bowles was just 100 yards away. But on the weekend of the murders, one of the closest cabins was hosting a party. Just down the road, Approximately 300 people were dancing, drinking, and screaming. A woman who was outside reading not far from the Bowles cabin attributed every scream to the festivities. Did the killer know there was going to be a party and take that fact into account before slaughtering the Bowles family? The noise certainly worked to his advantage, covering the sounds of the numerous gunshots that would ultimately take four lives. The party wasn't the only factor working in the killer's favor that weekend. Local law enforcement was distracted that weekend. An hour and a half south of Crestline, the Watts riots were in full swing in south-central Los Angeles. Many state highway patrolmen were down in Los Angeles that weekend. Many San Bernardino County sheriffs were sent there on loan to help contain the riots. While no killer could have planned for riots, an experienced one might well have chosen to take advantage of a riot in progress. The Watts riots began on August 11th and didn't calm until August 17th. 
Witnesses saw the Bowles family out and about on August 14th. One witness remembers them spending some time shopping in town and describes them as relaxed and happy. Other rumors surround James and Darlene's activities that day. They may have stopped at Club San Moritz to have lunch sometime during the afternoon. James may have received a phone call at the establishment that seemed to darken his mood, and Darlene may have mentioned a visitor who was expected to arrive at their cabin at 8 p.m. However, no news articles printed from 1965 to 1968 mention a Club San Moritz lunch or a mysterious phone call. It's tough to say where this story originated. Do you think it's plausible, or do you think it's the kind of fiction that gets attached to a case in retrospect as time goes by? Do you happen to know where this story came from? If so, let me know in the comments below. By Monday, August 16th, James' mother, Hester, was growing concern. It had been her son's habit to call her on most Sundays, and she hadn't heard from him yet. She phoned his work to see if he'd gone in, only to discover that his employer was also concerned. James hadn't shown up, and that wasn't like him. Hester called Darlene's mother, Rena, who called Darlene's brother, Floyd Rice. Rice called the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Office and the California Highway Patrol in the hopes that one of the two offices would perform a wellness check. Thanks to the riots, Rice was told he was going to have to wait. By 2 p.m., Rice decided to check the cabin personally. He traveled with co-worker John Wilcoxon. When he reached the cabin, he saw no cars in the driveway. Looking in the windows, he saw the dog on the couch, lying in a pool of blood. Rice then entered the cabin while Wilcoxon waited outside. The Bowles Crestline cabin was so new, they hadn't even installed a phone line yet, and it was sparsely furnished. Rice had delivered some bare-bones furnishings to the cabin the weekend prior. There were no valuables in the cabin, not even a radio or a television set. What there was when Rice entered that fateful day was a lot of blood in the bedroom. Rice found James on the floor with 15 bullets inside of him. Bobby was sitting upright against the wall with eight bullets inside of him. The bodies were fully clothed, and it looked like they'd been herded into the bedroom at gunpoint before the murders began. Darlene and Tommy were in the closet, and it looked like Darlene had fought hard to keep the killer from getting inside. The fight had been so intense that a closet door had been knocked completely off of its tracks. They found her crouched over Tommy's body in a futile attempt to shield him. The killer put multiple bullets into Darlene and Tommy as well. Bobby's wallet was on a table in the living room, emptied of ID cards and money. Later, investigators would admit they weren't sure he had any cash for the killer to take. With so little in the cabin, robbery seemed an unlikely motive. Robbers were operating in the area at the time all those empty cabins made for tempting targets, but they typically struck on weekdays, when the vacationers had returned to their workaday lives. The lack of apparent motive would continue to baffle police for years to come. With no phone in the cabin, Rice was forced to stumble into the sheriff's office to report the murders in person. Rice would later say he thought he was keeping everything together at the time, but the police said that he was clearly in shock. Police returned to the crime scene where they collected a series of 22 shells that they believed came from a rifle. Other than the rifle shells, the scene seemed devoid of clues. There were no fingerprints, and there was no other trace evidence. A size 11 man's footprint may have been found at the scene, though the footprint didn't make it into local news sources at the time. Sergeant Richard Wagner was appointed to field a nine-man investigation team. Wagner and the team would leave no stone unturned. The first problem the police faced was an inability to establish any motive they could prove. Nevertheless, they began searching the surrounding area. They gathered the names of registrants at every motel, hotel, and lodge in Crestline at the time of the slaying. They questioned anyone who moved from Crestline within a reasonable time frame. They questioned as many vacationers as they could find. They searched the area around the cabin inch by inch, covering a half-mile radius in the hopes of turning up anything, anything at all. Police sealed the cabin and didn't even allow family members to enter it. Eventually, the Orange County coroner, Raymond Brandt, even sealed their weekday home on Silvertip Court in Orange County, 
all on the off chance that some hint, some clue, might be found among their belonging. Police questioned and released several people who they felt may have known about the crime. They also investigated the Bowles family and their connections. They ran ballistics on every 22 caliber they could find, paying special attention to rifles, but they never found a match. Eventually, police found the family car. The red 1962 Dodge Polara four-door hardtop vehicle was abandoned on Forest Shade Drive near Bull Road in the Lake Gregory area. The killer's joyride wasn't long. It only took about four minutes to get to Bull Road from Jungfrau Drive. The killer had thrown the key to the car and the key to the cabin underneath the vehicle. There were no usable fingerprints anywhere in or on the vehicle. One witness came forward to say he saw a red car being driven erratically through the area that day and said he thought the driver was a white male. This witness did not come forward until a year after the murders. A second witness came in the form of a security officer at Club San Moritz, who claims he spotted a man camping on a ridge above the Bowles cabin roughly eight hours after the bodies were discovered. The camper, whom the guard described as being in his 40s, with thinning hair, owned a light-covered station wagon loaded with camping equipment. Though he was illegally parked on club property, the security officer apparently dismissed the camper as harmless. He never spoke with him, and he never took down the license plate number. Other witnesses spotted the light station station wagon in question three other times, twice driving by the Bowles cabin and once parked in the driveway on the day of the murders. No other witness came forward. There were several suspects, but none of them ever panned out. For example, there was Brother Bert, a handyman at a Crestline area church camp, who had been in the area at the time of the slaying. Police picked up Brother Bert in Mobile, Alabama, where he was a suspect in a different double homicide. San Bernardino County sheriffs drove down to Mobile to interrogate Brother Bert. Bert confessed to child molestation at the church camp. It became impossible to pin either the Bowles family murders on him or the bodies in Mobile. There was also Robert Laughlin, a local burglar. Police arrested him in connection with the Bowles family murders, but again could not pin him to the scene of the crime or elicit a confession. They later cleared him of all murder charges, though they did put him away for several robberies that had taken place nearby. Wagner and his team even reached out to police officers in Michigan, as well as to the Royal Canadian Mounted Police, in response to similar murders that had occurred out of state. These efforts were all ultimately unsuccessful. Police didn't collect DNA in 1965. They didn't know DNA testing was even a possibility. They didn't have cell phones, the internet, or an integrated crime scene database they could turn to. They were limited to more basic investigation methods. There is no existing DNA on file that may be tested today. Indeed, police at the time relied heavily on polygraph tests to conduct their interrogations. Unfortunately, today, we know that polygraph tests are extremely unreliable. In most jurisdictions, polygraph evidence is no longer admissible in court. The primary tool investigators had at their disposal to work this case in 1965, other than traditional canvassing, has now been outed as junk science. It's enough to make anyone wonder what police might have been able to discover had they had access to more sophisticated crime scene investigation methods. Sadly, it's unlikely we will ever know just how much information has been lost. In January of 1966, the San Bernardino County Sheriff's Department became alarmed when they realized that someone was entering the cabin, which was still sealed and closed to the public and the family. The invader had entered at least twice. Once, police found lights on in the cabin that couldn't be attributed to a police visit. A second time, police found the cabin door wide open again, apparently independent of any investigator's visit. There was no sign of forced entry. Whoever was entering and leaving the cabin apparently had access to a key. Where had they gotten a key? Who would even have a key? Had the killer somehow made a copy? These were questions the police were unable to answer at the time. These questions remain unanswered to this day. Police were quick to respond. For 33 days, beginning in late January, 40 officers worked 24-hour shifts each hiding inside the cabin and waiting for the intruder to return. They sat in the dark 
and in the cold to ensure that nobody knew they were there. After dark, a patrol car would arrive quietly near the cabin. Two men would get out and enter the residence. Two more would depart. Yet the intruder never returned. Who do you think the intruder was? Do you think it was the killer attempting to taunt the police? Someone savvy enough to pick up on the signs that the police were staking out the cabin in spite of the cop's best effort? Or was it someone who was attempting to conduct their own investigation, some reporter or amateur sleuth hoping to glean something from the scene of the crime? Could local kids have dared one another to enter the cabin for quick, cheap thrills? Did a clueless squatter spend a few nights in a crime scene before moving on? Who do you think the intruder was? Prior to the Bowles trip to Crestline, James Bowles had gone on an entirely different trip. He'd gone to South Africa. Hughes Aircraft had sent the engineer on a technically classified project that was designed to construct a tracking station. The South Africa trip underscores that James had access to valuable schematics, plans, and company information that would have been useful to other companies and governments worldwide. One of the rumors surrounding the case suggests that James had discussed retiring early and moving his family to the cabin. Was he discussing a future dream, or was he talking about imminent plans that he anticipated suddenly being able to afford? Another rumor suggests a second recent change in monetary plans. A conversation with a neighbor the weekend of the murder suggested the couple had been planning on slowly remodeling their cabin kitchen themselves, but now we're talking about hiring more contractors to do it. Remember, too, that the family vehicle was a late model, no more than three years old, essentially a brand new car, more big spending. Had James already sold some Hughes aircraft information to an interested buyer? Was the rumored lunchtime phone call and supposed 8 p.m. visit related to such a sale? Rumors also suggest that Darlene was nervous about the trip prior to going and felt that something was wrong. Was this intuition, or did she already have an inkling that James had made a big mistake? The lack of evidence at the crime scene, the perfect situation for hiding gunshots, and the herding of everyone in the home into one room certainly seem in line with a professional killer's behavior. While police couldn't identify any Bowles family enemies, one imagines Hughes aircraft might not have been eager to discuss a potential trade secret leak. Is it possible James Bowles got greedy, biting off far more trouble than he could chew? The Zodiac Killer is known to have been operating in Northern California between December 1968 and October 1969. Several killings linked to the Zodiac Killer involved the use of a 22 caliber, though he also used a variety of other methods to kill his victim. The Zodiac Killer would also have been both intelligent enough and experienced enough to turn factors like the party and the riot to his advantage. There is also evidence to suggest the Zodiac Killer often targeted individuals who were involved with the tech industry. At least one of the Zodiac murders involved the use of a light-colored car, much like the light-colored station wagon spotted near the Bull's cabin. Nevertheless, the Zodiac Killer did not write any of his signature taunting letters to either newspapers or police in regard to the Bulls' killing. He didn't attempt to take credit for them. None of the Zodiac Killer's signature ciphers were attached to this case. Of course, the Bulls' family murder took place three years prior to any known Zodiac Killer murders. The Bulls' killings also took place in Southern California, not Northern California. In addition, the Zodiac Killer was thought to use a 22 caliber handgun, whereas the Bowles family murderer was thought to use a 22 caliber rifle. The Zodiac Killer did claim 37 victims, not all of whom have been accounted for. Could the Bowles family have accounted for four of them? What do you think? Was this an early Zodiac murder, one that took place before the Zodiac Killer began taunting police with his crimes? Another rumor surrounding the case describes Darlene as somewhat flirtatious and a little wild, suggesting that she might have had affairs with other men. Some rumors also suggest that there were tensions between James and Darlene beneath that happy family facade, and that she was unhappy with the amount of business travel 
that James was required to pursue. If these affairs were ever the subject of a serious police investigation, they did not make the papers at the time. Nevertheless, the rumor does open up the possibility that a jilted lover could have killed the Bowles family. The killer could even have been the subject of a flirtation who believed Darlene was promising more than she really was. Do you think the police should have done more to investigate Darlene's love life? If they had, would they have turned up a new suspect? In 1968, Floyd Rice told the Los Angeles Times that the Bowles estate was still being settled in probate and that he wanted to sell the cabin. He said he did not want to keep it in the family. Most likely, this was the statement of a grieving man who wanted to be rid of a burden. Nevertheless, there are some inconsistencies surrounding the reporting regarding Floyd Rice. Some reports stated that Rice had no idea where the cabin was and had to call around to locate it prior to conducting his own wellness check. Other news stories said he'd been the one to deliver the furniture one week prior and so would have known exactly where the cabin was located. It's also not clear why Rice involved his co-worker Wilcoxon, who does not appear to have spoken up about the story. Did someone in the family hope to profit from the sale of a brand new cabin? Even in the late 1960s, such a cabin would have been worth a substantial amount of money, and the theory has gained some traction in various corners of the Internet in the past. There are problems with this theory. First, police thoroughly questioned and vetted everyone associated with the Bowles family, as mentioned earlier. By all accounts, the Rice and surviving Bowles family cooperated with the police at every turn to try to find the murderers. And Rice himself, if you'll recall, was described as being in genuine shock on the day that he found the bodies. As of right now, there is absolutely no evidence that Rice or any other person who stood to inherit the Bowles estate was involved with the crime. 120,000 strangers in a vacation town. 300 strangers at a nearby party. Is it possible one of these strangers was simply broken on the inside? Is it possible someone spotted an opportunity to play out a dark and disturbing fantasy on a family who couldn't defend themselves? While we don't like to contemplate the fact that someone might kill just for the fun of it, we know such people do exist. And in the absence of any other motive or evidence, one can't help but speculate. What do you think? Were the bowls just in the wrong place at the wrong time? Did they take their vacation just in time to be targeted by someone who was itching to murder a family full of perfect strangers? In 2003, Mountain News apparently ran a five-part series about the Bowles family murder. You can find the links, but you can't find the story. It seems to have been purged. Was it part of a routine archive cleanse conducted every few years, or did the story come down for another reason? I emailed the editor of the paper to ask for a PDF so far, there has been no response. In 2004, Davy Porter shot a documentary called The Bowles Murders. The film seemed to be created with a cast full of actors with no other credits. A single comment from a woman named Sue mentions that Porter was able to film inside the cabin itself. One actor appeared in a 13-episode TV series called Nana's Cottage, with which Porter was also involved from 2006 to 2007. Reporter Harlan Johansson apparently interviewed Porter in a 2003 article for Access Magazine titled On the Trail of a Killer. Archives of the article no longer seem to exist. The video went to Amazon Prime, but Amazon Prime says the video is no longer available for viewing in the United States. Davy Porter is a fairly common name. No Davy Porter as writer, filmmaker, or producer appears on LinkedIn. IMBD lists his official site as wolfpuppyfilms.com. There, a single movie is advertised, a 2019 production of Happy Ending Sleepover, apparently based on a 2014 why a novel that failed to sell very well. There is no mention of any previous work. Perhaps some of the most common internet rumors the size 11 shoe, the mysterious lunchtime phone calls, the early retirement came initially from one of these sources. But it's difficult to say. A single episode of the Misconduct podcast covered this case in 2019. In 2020, 
The podcast ceased production after covering many more cases, citing the pressures of the COVID-19 pandemic. Misconduct cited the now missing without a trace mountain news article as one source. Is it a mere coincidence that most of the more recent coverage of this case seems to have evaporated altogether? Or are there forces that simply do not want this case reopened and that do not want it to receive much attention? If any viewers have copies of the 2003 Mountain News article or the 2004 documentary, please let me know in the comments below. I spent hours attempting to track them down myself, and I'd be intrigued to see what information may be buried in these missing sources. Had Tom and Bob lived, they would have been 71 and 72, respectively. They would have lived full lives. They might have pursued careers, married, or had children. They would have lived through numerous technological changes. Perhaps they would have inherited that little cabin and brought their own families there. The questions continue to linger in their case. What was the true motive? Where is the murder weapon? Who could have committed such a heinous crime? Do you think it was espionage, the Zodiac killer, or a simpler motive? Do you have a new theory that nobody has considered yet? Please share your theories, thoughts, and insights in the comments below. Your thoughts might open new avenues of investigation that might ultimately allow someone to close this case. I hope you enjoyed this video and are enjoying the videos on my channel. My name is Vince, and if possible, please like, comment, and subscribe to my channel. I'll be posting new videos at least once a week. Clicking the little bell will send you a notification when a new video is posted. In the meantime, I invite you to watch one of my other two videos on your screen. Thank you.